Good day Eco 736 students. Welcome to week 5 of Development Economics. We continue learning more about measuring poverty and inequality. Your agenda for week 5 is to submit your weekly reading assignment 4 before lectures on Thursday. For those who are scheduled to present, please submit your presentation before the lecture as well. You need to review your lecture slides or clips and then come to the ICAMBA discussion forum on Thursday with your questions and answer. The agenda presented here is similar to your lessons tool on ICAMBA. Please use it every week to tick off what you have done. After this week, you should be able to discuss the limitations of poverty lines and also use dominance testing to overcome it. You should also be able to apply and interpret the most frequently used inequality measures, as well as interpret concentration curves in the context of targeted public spending. I'm sure that many of you recall that we ended off last week's lecture by looking at the limitations of poverty lines. How do we know what the appropriate poverty line is to use? And also, what kind of problems can arise if we set a poverty line that is too high? An alternative approach is to use dominance testing. Dominance testing uses the mechanics of, ra of ranking welfare distributions, which are then clarified by reference to stochastic dominance. Based on literature by Duclos, San and Younger, they suggest that st stochastic dominance testing should be used to compare poverty over multiple dimensions, example, all FGT measures, to avoid arbitrarily using an aggregated dimension like your human development index or setting poverty lines. So when using dominance testing as an alternative, we use what we call cumulative density function or cumulative density curves, where basically one arranges the population from poorest to riches and you express those below any given income level line as a percentage of the total population. This is on the y-axis. Once you've plotted your cumulative density functions, if the curves do not intersect over a poverty-relevant range, stochastic poverty dominance exists. And when stochastic poverty dominance exists, then any relative poverty ordering between groups or periods will remain unchanged for any FGT measure used at any poverty line. So that would account or hold for P0, P1, or P2, and for any given poverty line. So dominance testing makes the use of setting a poverty line redundant if you have stochastic poverty dominance. Now, this may sound very foreign, but I'm going to give you an intuitive sense of what it entails by looking at actual graphs. Okay, so look at this graph with two cumulative density functions, one for society red and another for society blue. Remember, on our x-axis, what we have is some proxy for income, and here we've got the learn of household expenditure per capita. And on your y-axis, remember what we spoke about in the previous slide, this is where we arrange society from poorest to richest and it accounts for, as you move up, the proportion of that society that lies below a particular income level. Okay, so what is this graph telling us? It's telling us, first of all, you can see that these two lines don't intersect. So that means that first, order dominance exists. Here is stochastic dominance in this graph, okay, at all income levels, right? So at all income levels, um, the blue line lies below the red line. And what does that mean? It means that irrespective of the poverty line 
that one may think of, which is denoted by Z. Remember, Z um, stands for poverty line. And irrespective of the alpha value of your um, absolute poverty index, so for it can either be alpha equaling 0 or alpha equals 1 or 2. Remember, P0 is your headcount ratio. P1 represents the depth of poverty. P2 is your severity of poverty. But for all of those measures, people in society blue have less poverty at all values, FGT values, and for irrespective of which poverty line you use. Okay, and this makes sense because you can see, for example, over here, let's look at the let's look at the nine the nine unit over here, this income level, household expenditure per capita of nine, whatever currency it may be in. The cumulative density there is sixty percent. So in society blue, sixty percent of that society more or less, will lie below that nine income level. Whereas in society red, it is higher. It's about 80%. And this occurs for all income levels across this distribution of the cumulative density function. Here we have yet another example. We're looking at uh, cumulative density curves or cumulative density functions for rural which is this one, urban and total population in South Africa in 1995. Remember once again, on your y-axis, it's the percentage of, in this case, um, individuals below each income level. And over here, on the y-axis, we've got per capita income of household containing, uh, of household containing individuals. Okay, so remember we prefer to log our, our income data, but over here they've given it, they haven't logged it, but it, it doesn't make a difference. What can you tell me about the scenario you see here? Which of these subgroups of society, your urban subgroup or your rural subgroup, is poorer irrespective of the poverty line chosen and irrespective of the FGT measure that is used. Can you guess? If you've guessed it's the urban population, then you are correct. First of all, you are correct because in this example, stochastic dominance prevails. We've got first order dominance. These cumulative density curves do not cross at all. So we can say very robustly and with certainty that at all poverty lines chosen, at all income levels, um, and for all FGT measures, your rural population is always going to be poorer than your urban population. Let's look at an example. Let's look at 1,500 1, year. At, if we have to choose 1,500 as an income level where we want to, to measure um, or compare two subgroups, in this case urban and rural, we can see in urban areas only about 10% of individuals fall below that income level. But if we look at your rural population, we find that at the same income level of 1.5, it's about 40% of rural population that falls below that income level. And you will find, doesn't matter what measurement you use, FGT measurement, P0, P1, P2, whether you're measuring simply your headcount poverty, the depth of poverty, or the severity of poverty, the rural population will always be worse off because stochastic dominance prevails here. These cumulative density function curves do not cross. Okay, don't panic. I'm sure some of you are wondering how on earth are we going to analyze this graph because unlike in the previous graph where none of the CDFs intersected and stochastic uh, dominance prevailed, you can clearly see here that some of these lines are crossing. 
So how do we analyze what is happening here? Take a breath and relax. Let's get back to basics. Just orientate yourself. Look at your y-axis. Remember, that's the cumulative percentage of households or individuals. You know, it, it will change depending on what you're analyzing below each income level. And the income levels are denoted on the x-axis. And over here, it's just per capita income in 2000 prices. They haven't logged it. Okay. So what you're looking at here. Each color represents the CDF, the cumulative density function, or the cumulative density curve for a different province in South Africa. Okay? And now you have to use your knowledge of dominance testing to try and rank these provinces as far as you possibly can in terms of where poverty is the worst. Okay? So, perhaps we should start with a rather easier example. Let's compare, for example, the CDF of Limpopo. So, Limpopo is this pink CDF right on top. And let's say the Western Cape. Okay? The Western Cape is the black one almost here at the bottom. Right. So... Between, if I have to only imagine that pink line and the black line and all these other province CDFs in between, imagine they disappeared, right? If I compare Limpopo and the Western Cape, I can definitely say that there is a first order dominance or the stochastic dominance there because those two curves don't intersect. And if I had to describe which of those provinces are more poor, irrespective of the poverty line used, irrespective of the FGT measure used um, uh, to describe poverty, what will the answer be? The answer will be that Limpopo is definitely poorer than the Western Cape, or the Western Cape is less poor than Limpopo because stochastic dominance prevails there. And it will be robust, that finding, that ranking will be robust irrespective of the poverty line used or the FGT poverty index used. Okay, so that's quite simple. But now, if we look at, say, uh, a very, uh, a more tricky situation where our CDFs are intersecting, so let's let's look here down at the bottom. Let's look at uh, what is the gray? How ting and the black is the Western Cape. Okay. So what we see that from the income uh, per capita income of zero to what is that? About five thousand five hundred rand. The stochastic dominance. Um, prevails but only up until that line here they intersect so we can say with absolute certainty that from zero to about what is this 5500 rand that the western cape has less poverty than Gauteng okay does that make sense to you after this point of intersection, it changes, okay? Then from 5,500 Rand to the um, upper limit of the income per capita income, which here is 10,000, over there, we've got our gray line below the black line. What does that mean now? Only from about 5,500 to 10,000 Rand per capita income. Between that range, uh, stochastic dominance prevails. You've got first order dominance, where we find that Gauteng has less poverty than the Western Cape, irrespective of the poverty line or the FGT used. But the clause here is the poverty line used from 5,500 to 10,000. So we cannot claim here is stochastic dominance between East, uh, Western Cape and Gauteng for the full distribution or the full spectrum of income from 0 to 10,000. No, 